Hello, wider listeners. Sorry for the late start, everybody. This is Media Ciphers, the only program where we talk about what's really going on here at the local level, the county, the state, the country, and the nation, and all around the world. From the perspective of some uh, rather well-read working-class folks. As always, the following thoughts, views, and opinions are not necessarily those of 89.1 WIDR or Western Michigan University, no matter how dope or insightful they may turn out to be. So, as always, we have a lot to talk about on the show today, and of course, I'm sure many of you out there have heard the breaking news. The Supreme Court Justice, uh, uh, Supreme Court, uh, sorry, not Supreme Court Justice, but there has been a leak from the Supreme Court, a majority opinion that will effectively overturn Roe v. Wade. And we're going to be talking about that in greater depth later on in the program. Uh, I remember the first place I saw this article was Politico. It's kind of uh, unprecedented for a Supreme Court uh, opinion to be leaked in this way. Of course, it's not surprising. You know, if I were a do-gooder, a do-gooder whistleblower inside the Supreme Court, I might do something very similar myself. So uh, one thing I do want to point out to folks who are listening at home is that uh, I just posted on our Facebook page, that's Media Ciphers, look it up. We have a podcast episode that deep dives into the origins of the anti-abortion movement. Uh, that's uh, episode three of our podcast, by the way. And, and also talks about how regular, ordinary people can organize against it. And uh, again, we'll be talking about it a little, in a little bit more depth later on the program. But I did want to let y'all know, if you want a good primer on how we got to where we are today, uh, it's a good episode. Uh, we start the discussion on anti-abortion issues around the 23 minute mark that's episode three of our podcast media ciphers kalamazoo look it up if you want a primer on the origins of the anti-abortion movement and how to organize against it right now uh we are going to be playing an interview that i did over the weekend with local journalist artist and poet casey groton to talk about uh, something that's a little bit closer to home, we're going to be having a long-form discussion about Radiant Church. The long and the short of it, and uh, obviously you'll find out more in the interview, Radiant Church has a lot of businesses downtown, match, match head coffee, etc., etc. But they're not being completely honest with the community about where they stand on some very important uh, social and cultural issues. And we're going to be talking about how the... Uh, larger church organizations discriminatory stance against LGBTQ uh, folks bleeds in to how they carry themselves and uh, act in the community. So uh, we're going to be playing a real quick little break and then we're going to be going into that interview that I did with Casey over the weekend. Y'all are listening to Media Ciphers only on 89.1 WIDR or online at widerfm.org. Your only source for political revolution. Wider FM is the student-run radio station at Western Michigan University. Along with the Western Herald and Western Herald Video, Wider is part of the WMU Student Media Group and is supported in part through generous donations from listeners like you. 
If you would like to join this list of generous donors, please click the donate button at WIDRFM.org and support our mission for radio evolution. The website, once again, WIDRFM.org, on your radio at 89.1 Wider FM. This is, again, Media Ciphers, only on 89.1 WIDR, Kalamazoo, or uh, you might find us on uh, WIDRFM.org, or you know, please check out us on uh, Facebook, YouTube, and our, our podcast. Uh, so today, uh, we're joined by local artist and poet, uh, Casey Groton. Uh, some of y'all may, may be familiar with their work. And uh, you're actually joining me to talk about, this is something that's been on my radar for a bit now, and I'm glad finally getting the chance to kind of sit down and talk about it, because it's, it's something I've kind of heard hubbub about, um, and I know you've been, really been out there doing a lot of your own, putting your own time into, into doing that type of research and raising awareness about this. Uh, but here today, we're going to be talking about uh, the uh, Radiant Church and their presence downtown, and particularly how uh, that is perhaps a bit problematic given um, some of their stances. So I, I think I just want to just first, you know, introduce yourself uh, to the listeners and if you could just give us like a, an overview, kind of sketch out for the listeners, uh, how you became aware of uh, Radiant Church and what has be- become particularly concerning to you regarding um, their uh, stance or, uh, against LGBTQ people. Um, if you, if, I should frame it that way, but uh, go ahead and just, uh, if you could inform the listeners about uh, that a little bit more. All right, um, well, my name is Casey Groton. Uh, I've been in Kalamazoo for mm, since 2009. Um, I grew up in Goebbels and I've been here for that the, since then. Um, Radiant came onto my radar because of a Facebook message I received from someone who knew that I write for Second Wave Media of Michigan, <clears throat> which is a um, as a journalist, which it's a news source, it's all online. Um, they emailed me just asking if I had heard anything about Radiant and given me information to uh, to like possibly do a story. So I contacted my editor, Mess uh, brought her into the loop to see if that was something that uh, she would want me to write on. But second wave is solution-focused journalism, so we don't do exposés. Um, and an exposé is literally how it sounds. You're exposing like an issue. Um, and so she paid me to do research, and then we approached MLive with the research um, to see if they wanted to pick up the story. And that was like maybe like two months ago, and nothing has been um, picked up yet. And We'll probably get into why, but that's how it first came onto my uh, into my life. How I knew about it. I can't hear you. <laughs> Sometimes I forget to unmute myself. Yeah. Um, all right. So, uh, could you just kind of um, describe briefly? So, you know, for those who may be completely unaware, like what's what's wrong with Radiant Church? Could you describe a little bit more about how you found out about like the, you know, their stance on these particular issues and, and uh, what those are? Yeah, so the way that I found once, the, the way that, that I was approached was like, look at this church, they're coming you know, downtown, they're trying to do a takeover. And um, 
certain parts of that have been like really hard to prove just because um, when it comes to like the money and things like that, it gets a little hard to get answers or find people to talk to about it. Um, but it was really easy to find their stance about LGBTQ, which is the one that sticks out the most. Um, I have spoken to people who I'm not allowed to name, but I have spoken to multiple people of color, um, uh, one person of color and a couple black people who have been very uh, clear that they felt tokenized um, and they felt like they were used in the space um, not for like just being welcome on their own but like used to get other people to join because that's radiance radiant is super open about their vision of um just like expansion it's always about expansion 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 all the time um <clears throat> but the lgbt lgbtq stance was super easy to find and i'm looking through my notes um they are Radiant is a part of the Assemblies of God denomination of Christianity. So for folks who might not know what denomination means, that just means like you've heard of Catholicism, you've probably heard of like Baptist, uh, Apostolic, <clears throat> uh, Pentecostal, things like that. Um, that's another one is Assemblies of God. And on their official website, they formally come out against homosexuality. Um, and that was very easy to find. It was not hard to find. It was right there. And um, part of my research was I attended a virtual service for their uh, Spring Arbor, which is right by Jackson, Michigan location. And it was just a regular Sunday service. And out of nowhere, the pastor just started talking about trans folks. And it really had nothing to do with the story. I think he was talking about Zacchaeus, which is about as far removed from <laughs> LGBTQ stuff that as you can get but um, yeah it was very easy to find um, and I actually if you want I can send you my research so I don't know if you can like include links so in case people want to like fact check some of the stuff they can go and just look oh no that that would be very much appreciated and, uh, and you know folks especially if you're looking at this online we'll drop uh, we'll make sure to post that all that up uh, along uh, along with this material um, so uh, kind of the, the next thing I want to follow up with is just kind of explaining, um, you know, uh, the, the scale of what's going on. You know, uh, uh, one thing you and others have mentioned, you know, the, the, this expansion, uh, you know, is quote unquote, like taking over downtown. Um, could you talk about the way that they are buying up multiple properties downtown and just kind of concretely like what what are those properties? So as far as the properties, I received a list and this list has been, um, these are people in the community that were concerned and they did this research on their own. Um, again, I'm not gonna say who, but uh, they basically just went downtown and saw who had affiliation. So these, I'll, I'll give two pieces of information. The first part is gonna be just businesses that are known to be affiliated with Radiant. And by affiliated, I mean either there are deacons who work there or there's people who are um, church attendees who also work at the, the business. Um, the grazing table is the new charcuterie place that showed up, I think it opened last year. They are very openly affiliated with Radiant. Um, and then we have Matchhead Coffee, which we'll talk about as well. Um, Tavani Sa uh, Salon and Spa. Uh, and then those are the those are the four ones. Oh, sorry, in Rose Street Nutrition. Nutrition. Those are the four places downtown that have direct affiliation. Then there's a few other places downtown where there had been calls made. I personally went into um, let me see if I can find the list or find. Hmm. Oh, it's called the Waiting Room. It's a a small barber shop that's in the back of a clothing store right next to Be Joyful. Um, their head barber is a member of Radiant. Um, those are the four, or those are the five that I know for sure. Um, and then the rest of them were be to uh, to be determined. But as far as, and the second part is, as far as what the buildings that they have bought, they did buy the old Manja Manja space. So in late 2019, Manja Manja released a um, 
some press that said that they were closing for you know whatever reasons that they were going to start uh, focusing more on catering, and then <clears throat> and then in the beginning of 2020, Radiant Church started um, doing promotion for Match Head Coffee which is not just the Mancha Mancha space, the Mancha Mancha space and the building, or and the portion of the building above it. And they raised $7 million and $2 million of it went to, at least this is what it says on the website, $7 million of it was raised and $2 million of it went to that buildup of the Mancha Mancha space. And if you've been downtown, it is a worship center in the back and it's a coffee shop in the front really open layout and on the website it says that it is a center um, like as a source of evangelism and evangelism essentially is like um, kind of like people really not not just talking about their um, evangelizing is you are trying to get people to convert to your uh, Christianity or your your I, I haven't really heard about evangelism in other religions as much uh christianity is very much in your face in that way um but you have match head coffee and the other portion of the seven million was going to building uh building out portions of their richmond campus which is kind of out by gall lake or sorry richland campus which is out by gall lake and then portage which i believe is the old uh, kalamazoo valley church in like the late 2000s, uh, like 2008, 2009, that same building, I believe, which is on Romance, um, build out for like a children's center. So as far as like taking over downtown, I think that I'll be honest, I do think that that is like, it it might be a little alarmist language, um, but I do see the validity in that that language um, at the same time. Um, I think that my alarm comes from how their stance openly is like everybody is welcome, but then when it actually comes down to it and you look at what their policies are and the reason why the policies are important is because that's where their money comes from, is from like who is giving them their money, the different grants that they receive and whatnot. Those are coming from a lot of religious organizations and religious folks who are a part of Assemblies of God. and. And assemblies of God could not be more clear. <clears throat> yeah, and and just to really make this concrete for everybody, uh, the properties we're talking about, you know, just not necessarily just nebulously downtown. Like almost all of the all of these are on the mall. Um, yeah, on Burdick. So just think like that is a very high concentration of, of businesses affiliated with this very specific men- entity, which, as you said. Um, has, uh, you know, overt and very uh, well-stated goals about evangelizing to their point of view, which, yeah. um, uh, again, as I just said, it kind of runs counter to um, some of the more kind of progressive uh, things that you kind of take for granted here in Kalamazoo. Uh, so yeah. I, I wanted to uh, kind of, you know, I think you got into a little bit, uh, but maybe diving just a little bit deeper. Um, so, you know, we're, we're speaking more broad, broadly about the way Radiant has been kind of, uh, you know, sn- snatching up as many of these properties as, these can- as they can and talking a little bit about how, uh, how we think of, of, of space, how space is held uh, in public and in particular what, what certain institutions taking up space uh, says about a community or their agenda. Uh, so maybe just diving a little bit deeper into, you know, kind of what you were just talking about. What do you think is the importance to an institution like Radiant Church and having such an outsized presence uh, in downtown Kalamazoo? I'm glad you asked this because I was thinking about it when I was answering the last question is that um, when in the last few years, there's been lots of like surveys of folks in Kalamazoo, like um, I wish I could remember the names of them, but basically like when you look around, uh, like, and you see the, the new public art that's going up, um, regardless of who's doing it, but the new public art that's going up or the way that they're changing the various parks or the, even like signage or like parking and things like that. A lot of that has to do with these various surveys that were, um, 
part of like the change Kalamazoo and things like that that have come up the last couple of years. And one of the main feedback from those <clears throat> from those various surveys was that people who aren't white don't feel comfortable downtown. And that's, um, I mean, I won't say that's surprising, but it is kind of sad to me because if you think about the primarily non-white communities, like they're they're right there downtown, and um, so they don't feel comfortable in their own home. And so when we think about like what is the importance of like, or what does it mean for something like this to be taking up so much space downtown, specifically on the on a main downtown street on Burdick, um, I think it's like. I think it's very important to think about because it's pretty much exactly the opposite of what the folks in Kalamazoo have been saying that they want. Um, and it's important to think about it as well because Southwest Michigan first, so they're the folks who run the, um, they have, I'm sorry, I'm losing myself here. Let me check my notes here. I did uh, about a month ago, I, kind of came for Southwest Mass Michigan first, not on purpose. I didn't realize who they were exactly when I started to like email them. And I was spending so much time going through like how to write these emails. Um, and then I realized that I was never going to get such an eloquent response. It was always just super human resource sounding like uh, basically the Southwest Michigan first, you can sign up to be a part of their um a part of their business like section on their website and you pay $500, there's a screening process. And if, if this isn't gonna be video, I'm doing heavy, heavy, heavy air quotes there. When I say sc screening processes, you process, you basically pay the money and you get into this, uh, on, you get perks from it. You get like a ribbon cutting ceremony, you show up on their website, you have promotional opportunities throughout the year when you are, as long as you're an active member. Um, and I approached them asking them about their screening process because in their platform on their website, like what their what their platform is as far as ethics, there is a portion in there about like equity and diversity and inclusion. And it's it's right, like I said, it's it's right there. So what I wanted to say, or right there on the Assemblies of God website, what I wanted to say when I say that it's so clear. On the Assemblies of God website, in this portion, when they talk about their stance on LGBTQ issues, their stance on LGBTQ issues is that they don't, they think that it is so morally corrupt that they don't even think that they need to talk about it, which is super bizarre to me because it's like, an, they're saying that it's a non issue, even though it's obviously a huge issue. Um, However, that being said, the reason why my editor and I think that it wasn't my story like wouldn't be picked up or wasn't picked up is because an anti-LGBTQ institution or church is not news. The news is like, do they still have tax exempt status? And this comes back, no, this is a long answer, so I apologize. Um, but this comes back to the point of like taking up space. In 2020, there were like nine plus businesses that closed downtown alone. And a lot of them were, or I'm sorry, all of them were locally owned, uh, like small businesses. And one of the reasons, like when I go down, when I was doing this research and talking to people about why various business closed, uh, the property taxes came up as one of the reasons in multiple conversations. It was one of the only common factors in all these conversations, <clears throat> excuse me. and. With a 501c3 status, they don't have to pay taxes. And so Match Head Coffee is literally almost an entire building. <laughs> and it takes up, you know, a good portion of that first block there on Burdick after you turn off of whatever that street that is, Kalamazoo or Michigan. Um, and they don't have to pay that. And so I was looking at the IRS website, seeing like how much a 501c3 has to make in order for them to keep their status and it's super up in the air like it's case by case and so they could be making millions of dollars um through that business like through their evangelism but on paper if it's like what coffee they're selling and what their you know their profit would be throughout the year if it's less than a certain amount then they still don't have to pay property taxes <laughs>
No, no. Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, thank you for sketching that out for us. Uh, you know, it, it, it ties it, especially like, you know, any, any Kalamazoo resident can kind of see see firsthand how this has developed you know again 2020 the pandemic we have all these businesses uh, you know shutting down and then um we see you know radiant which has the resources and, and you know, what you're saying also these tax breaks that puts them a particular advantage to kind of swoop in and then scoop these properties up And kind of what we were ta- you were talking about earlier, like you know, residents would like more, more you know, locally owned business. You know, regardless of you, you know, bringing up some of these more uh, um, uh, you know, ideological issues that we're talking about here. But um, so, so, so you you mentioned Southwest Michigan first, and actually ties really well into the next question I was, I was going to bring up. So uh, just a little bit of context, longtime listeners. I know you you might have heard me talk about this to death, but I always want to like under- state the context before we get it. So Southwest Michigan First um, is basically a, uh, a business resource group, if you want to call it that. You know, it's it's basically fuzzy language. So like the, if we're talking, looking at this from like, you know, analyzing the political economy of Kalamazoo, they're, they're basically the entity uh, that controls uh capitalism uh, in town if you, you know, call it that they a lot of their 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 folks develop things like the foundation for excellence so uh, the the southwest michigan first has a lot of power in, in determining uh economically how council is going to work look sorry uh and uh, there is this contradiction between you know you mentioned on their website you have these uh, you know, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion uh, stuff that you would assume, uh, given you know the kind of progressive nature of our city. But at the same time, uh, you know, l- let's think back to about a year ago, uh, they were trying to uh, install Lee Chatfield as their next chair, uh, who was, again had very extreme right wing views, um, a lot of you know kind of similar anti LGBTQ stuff, a lot of rhetoric against uh, quote unquote leftism. Uh, and as we found out later, it's very financially corrupt. Um, but there seems to be this really big schism between, um, you know, these these very conservative reactionary forces uh, in Kalamazoo, in Kalamazoo's ruling class that have wield this economic power uh, versus kind of this uh, uh, cultural perception of Kalamazoo as a progressive city. And I was wondering maybe you could speak a little bit to that, you know, one, that contradiction but also uh kind of it's like is that like kind of a like a like an mo of trying to shift the culture a little bit with um you know not only with radiance but with these more culturally conservative people who wield most of the economic power in this town short answer i think yes um i i did want to clarify a couple things when i said i couldn't remember what the Southwest Michigan First was like on their business page. It's the Chamber of Commerce, the the folks who run the Chamber of Commerce. And it sounds super official when you say it, but then when you actually go on the web page and you realize that you essentially pay a fee and then you're in, doesn't, it it breaks that down pretty hard. Um, The other thing is, I think that, and again, this has to do with like the language you're using. So when we're doing people, or sorry, not you, but like figurative, like, so when we say downtown takeover, and then you actually look at what's going on, there might be a bit of a stretch there. When you say like, do you think that this is happening on purpose? For some of them, yes, for sure. But if you go on to the South Michigan First website, then you look at their board of directors. 
there is, you know, there are, you have the Kalamazoo, you have a couple Kalamazoo billionaires in there, and then everybody else, um, they're like business owners, obviously. There's a couple people of color, um, but it's primarily white folks. And I think what's happened, I think what happens is um, more of an apathy, less of a, I really want to make Kalamazoo super conservative, more, it's more about like, are there funds like okay yep cool there's funds coming in is that where the money is it's not so much and i I might be naive because i do think that there are people there that pulls there are people in kalamazoo that pull strings to make it more conservative and they kind of use that shield of well this is a college town you know you can walk down the street and you know you can be whoever you want to be you don't get like beat up you don't have too much trouble but we still have a lot of issues that are conservative issues. Um, and it's all, it all happens underneath the surface and occasionally it bubbles over. And this is, I think one of those times. Um, but when I say apathy, what I mean is I went back in my Facebook messages to Southwest Michigan first. And again, I did spend like, I spent like two days crafting this first message and it goes into their platform. Part of their platform on Southwest and West Michigan first says, uh, inclusive, inclusivity and diversity are a part of our organization's destiny. And then I went and I coupled that with the information I found from the Assemblies of God website. And the message that I got back the first time it was just a cookie cutter response. Um, And that shows me that apathy that I was talking to you about. It's just, I don't know if it's necessarily like purposely trying to make Kalamazoo a more conservative place. I think it has more to do with Radiant Church has the ability as a super church, as like a super organization with a great, with a great social media team. They have, you know, they bring people in to teach you how to fundraise um, they have the ability to bring in millions and millions of dollars um, in a very short period of time. And so that's where the money is. And so I think some people just don't care because that wasn't the only email I sent. I emailed probably five or six of the board members and no one ever got back to me at all. So. Well, th- thank you. That is, you know, that's really illuminating. And, you know, I, 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 I definitely agree with you to an extent, um, you, you know, um, a, a lot of this really is, it's, it's kind of, as we mentioned, like it is, it, if you're radiant church, you're looking at it, this opportunity, all of these empty buildings, um, and, you know, you have the financial resources and tax incentives to kind of make, uh, make that reality. But I, I wanted to talk a little bit. This is this is kind of more talking about some some broader cultural issues that are going on nationwide. But I thought it was important to talk about this discussion because you know obviously you know recently we've been seeing this very broad uh, resurging national campaign. You look at corporate outlets like you know Fox News or any number of conservative ones. There's been this huge upsurge in, in slander and really like the stoking of these, these bigoted narratives about the LGBTQ community. Whether you're talking about these, these groomer allegations, um, obviously we're seeing the, the very draconian legislation in states like Texas against trans folks. Uh, I was wondering, how do you feel institutions like Radiant Church uh, factor into this larger national assault on uh, LGBTQ peoples and rights? Looking for new trails to explore? Asylum Lake is a 274-acre nature preserve that serves as a great research area for professors and students alike at WMU, while also being a great spot to hike. Entrances are on Winchell Avenue and Drake Road. Enjoy the adventure. Um, this, this I feel more like I didn't feel I don't feel uncomfortable answering the other questions. It's just my and my editor at uh, my editor at Second Wave and I spoke about this. It it's so hard to get information about the the pieces of this story that would actually make it a story, meaning like the money. Um, it's very difficult to to get into that and like almost impossible. I've had a very hard time. Um, 
but when you talk about this sort of thing, which I would just call like creating otherness, is this is where I really feel like comfortable talking about it. And I have a, um, I have an excerpt from an article that I did not write, but um, there is a church that opened up in a a very radiant-esque church that opened up in indiana and this was the this is a a quote from the article from one of the business owners right across from where the church was being built and she said i'm opposed to homophobia wherever it lives but i'm especially concerned about the presence of this church was called pioneers i'm especially concerned about the presence of pioneers in this particular neighborhood because safe spaces are so rare and important to queer people um, uh, <clears throat> she said their last name is uh, Nordgren and again I'll include this with you um, she also said this neighborhood has traditionally been so welcoming because of the community facing business aspect which I think applies to Kalamazoo especially in the last few years because there are a lot of small businesses and owned by people that you know there are neighbors um because of the community community facing business aspect i fear that people will unwilling unwittingly stumble <clears throat> into pioneers not knowing that it's not a place where they're celebrated or embraced that last part really th- that's the reason why i put this into my research because <clears throat> my issue with radiant being downtown is like people like me who live here i identify as trans non-binary um and you know if you are hungry and it's the only place that's open on a sunday or something like that and you don't know anything about it and you're like oh wow this looks new because i mean it looks great money then by all means you have the money to do that um <clears throat> and they're nice everyone's like the one time i accidentally walked into the grazing uh the grazing table or whatever it's called like I mean, I was weirded out because I grew up in the church. So as soon as like four people greet me when I walk in the room, I'm automatically like, eh. but like, th- that's my issue is like, it creates an otherness without being otherness right out front. Like you don't know it until you're there. You don't know it until you've created a relationship. You don't know it until you've given them money. And like, that's the point is like, how can they be allowed to make money here when they're not open about how they feel about people? Like they say, oh, you're all welcome. You're not really, you're not really. Like you're all welcome until you decide to go to a Sunday service. Like this was, like I said, the one that I went to, it was just some random service in December. Like <laughs> there was, no, it wasn't like, we're gonna talk about homosexuality today. Um, and I just think it's very, very important to like even if it's like your five dollars that you're gonna spend on like whatever a croissant or something like i feel like we deserve to be able to know where we're putting that little bit of our money you know because five dollars times you know a thousand people or something like who walk in there and don't know and yeah i guess i'm I might not have too much like more to say about that specifically, but I definitely feel feel very like poignant and sentimental about it because it's it's just so important. Queer queer friendly spaces, queer safe spaces, um, they're they're not they really there's not a whole lot of them. And people again, people think that Kalamazoo is super liberal and oh well, I've got gay friends or this or that or you can walk down the street and hold hands. Like yeah, I guess you can, but like also that that doesn't mean you're celebrated. It doesn't mean you can thrive like you can serve survival is different than thriving we all know that no no that, that's that, you know that's a really great point and you know again they like you know these businesses uh that they, they don't discriminate against gay money but uh, so, you know um that's uh and you know that it's something worth i really think really drilling down to because again this is this is an area downtown used to be a hop skipping a jump you know out front I had an office down there, and um, this is again, this is a place where the whole community comes to congregate. You know, thinking about like our cop, things like that. Uh, so, you know, whatever businesses are there, it is very much a shared space, and it is that's why it's so important that you know there needs to be like genuine uh, welcoming and not uh, you know your dollars might 
end up going to fund, uh, you know, somebody proselytizing against LGBTQ folks. Um, so what, something uh, I, I did want to, you know, obviously I want to hold space to see, like, is there, uh, you know, especially in your research, in your journalism, or just, you know, uh, as, as a resident or anybody else, you know, uh, tried to reach out to Radiant Church with these uh, criticisms and concerns. Have you gotten any response to them? And if so, what was it? Yeah, so, and I can't say names just because uh, I am not allowed. I don't have permission. Um, it's how you keep but, your sources safe. So, yep. Yeah. <laughs> um, there is a there is an entity on Western's campus called Wesley, the Wesley Foundation, and it is a Christian organization, but they are openly, um, they're openly open and affirming, which essentially for people who have never heard that before, it means that you really can come as you are. Um, I know, I think People's Church on 11th Street, or wait, sorry, People's Church on 10th Street, <clears throat> they are also open and affirming and um. So I, I think suppose, of a lot of other progressive churches. Uh, yeah, of FCC course. That, comes to mind, et cetera. Yeah, downtown, yeah. for sure. Um, and it's important to have them. Um, sorry, I was just thinking, like, not not even just if you're religious, but even just, like, having a community. If you've ever, like, if anyone has ever grown up in a church, like, I'm just thinking, like, logistically, the amount of free food that is accessible from having a church community or like if you need a ride somewhere, like let's say your car breaks down, there's someone in the church that is a mechanic and you can get like work at cost. Like having that community is super important. And that has to do with this, like creating a sense of otherness. It's a taking away accessibility to people who need it. Like they're bringing in a false church community right downtown where people in people who marginalized community communities in Kalamazoo have said specifically in the area that Radiant Church is creating this downtown city center that they need accessibility and they're feigning it. They're, they're saying, oh, you have it, but they really don't. They just want your money. Um, but anyway, to say, <laughs> to go back to your question, this question, um, Wesley Center was, a, the Wesley Foundation was approached last year before the, uh, before the city center came into existence. <clears throat> the city center being, uh, Match had coffee in the old mantra space, mantra mantra space. Um, they were approached and they were asked if they could house their weekly church services in Wesley's community room. Um, the person who they approached at Wesley Foundation, you know, knew about Radiant and they'd known people that had worked there. And the people there, this is where I got my information about like the tokenization of the black folks that had been hired there. Um, and it's just, it was so clear to them that that's what was happening. But the person at the Wesley Foundation that I, this is my source, they, they responded by saying, you know, of course, like, we'd love to have you. We'd love, we'd love to, uh, you know, house you here. These are our tenants of, this is our platform. These are the things that we believe are our destiny. This is what our organization stands for. And, uh, one of them is being open and affirming and uh, Radiant Church denied because of that specific stance. Um, yeah, so that's that's one thing that I have. Um, that that's that's the main one I would say that I have heard. The same person also spoke about a church, um, a church called Engedi, which is another super kind of superpower church in Michigan. Um, <clears throat> And they were looking to open up in Kalamazoo and that fell through, um, I mean, in my opinion, luckily, because it was just another thing like this. Um, the main portion, like when when you when you are being trained to be a pastor at Engedi, um, and they said that this is very similar to Radiant, the main, the main portion of that training is learning how to fundraise. And it's not fundraising so you can do the Lord's work. The primarily primary function was expansion. It's just expansion. And the only reason you expand like is to get more money. I mean in this in this type of super church game or game. But uh, yeah, that that definitely came to mind when you were asking, like who else have I spoken to?
Wow. Well, that I, I think I think that actually gives a little bit more context than just if you were to get some boilerplate response from Radiant. Um, I, mean, I think it'd be easier for easy for them to say, "Oh, we welcome everybody," and it's like you know, some some restrictions apply, that sort of thing. Um, uh, so I guess like the, the last thing I really just want to leave leave uh, y'all with, or, or just ask you. So uh, just. You know, is there anything else that we haven't covered about Radiant Church that you found in your research that you think would be important to talk about? Um, I just think the money. So it's the one thing that I could find the littlest about. It's incredibly easy to find information on how to donate to them. But as far as, um, and I, as far as like what their specific plans are with the money, even on like what, as far as like where, like certain amounts of dollars are allocated it was very difficult to find any sort of like pdf or file or you know something that i could look at they they had the seven million dollars broke down they're like two million went here three million went here and i'm like okay but what about like the 100k that came from someone living in windchill you know or so you know what i'm saying like i want to know specifically and i wonder like if you were to donate a certain amount if then you become privy to those details that's where what i care about and also like southwest michigan first like these are the chamber of commerce like that's supposed to serve the people that live here um or i mean they say that it's supposed to serve the people that live here but it was re it's really clear to me that like as someone who's lived here um that i wasn't able to I wasn't able to find anything. And I believe it's Congressman Upton. Um, he is on the board for it. And I also, I mean, I knew it was kind of a crapshoot to like, you know, email him. But I had, a, I emailed him and then I had the letter that I had copied and I gave it to, I think like probably 10 to 15 people all emailed the same thing, but they had, you know, they modified it and they sent their own and they were letting me know that they had sent it and that was in february and so in february you have 10 to 15 letters being sent all saying like please revoke please reverse the status of this church because it literally goes against your platform and i haven't heard anything back um they have all my up-to-date contact information so as far as what other people would know or like what to look into i just the money like if, if anyone has any information or I, I i feel a little overwhelmed because the response was so much like well good luck you know and it is a little um it's hard to be like one person looking at it in under a microscope and then also being like well now you're gonna move you're gonna go through a breakup you're gonna do this and all these things like in my actual like real life and then you know trying to like be like okay well i care about this but like how much money did i get paid how much time do i actually have after i get done with my full-time job so as far as like yeah like what else i want people to know it's just the money is very hard to track you can even donate stocks to radiant which i thought was bizarre i mean i didn't even, i was like okay well how does that work i don't know i think it's one of those things where you actually have to start the process of doing it and then you find out the details but i'm not going to donate them anything at all not even in like not not yet anyway not, not not even in like a hypothetical to find out information because i i don't trust them wow you, yeah no and and but really you, i try to stress this with everybody learning, but, but really thank you for all the incredible work that you've done on this issue and this is why it's important to fund independent journalism uh everybody out there um and so you know a lot of times i'll leave like my guess like a last question like what can what can like the average resident do uh you know if, if they're concerned about this and you know it's a very this is a very complicated subject i think there's there's a number of angles you could talk about going like you know uh we we saw it last year there was and, and you know, as cynical as we can get about local politics, there was a successful pushback against Lee Chatfield that became a huge public relations disaster for Southwest Michigan first. Um, there's other things to think about, like, you know, how, how can we preserve spaces downtown for some of these local businesses? Maybe that's something to take up with either like, you know, uh, trying to get the city to, you know, buy up some of those properties and give them to local people or starting a land bank ourselves. But um, again, there's lots of different angles you could you could take to think about how to address this problem. 
Um, but I'm, I'm concerned just, you know, you as a journalist and also just as somebody who is uh, trans and non-binary, like what would you, what would you like to see happen, uh, you know, to, to address this, this, this issue? Oh, I think the easiest way or rather like simplicity and easiness are not always the same. I'll say that the simplest way to make an impact is just not to not to patronize their business. Um, and so and that means like if you see someone coming out of there, like if you're walking by, so you're like, you know, hey, you're like, hey, you know, I'm sorry to bother you. Like, my name's Casey. Can I just can I talk to you about where you just came out of? And, you know, that might not everyone's in a position to that. I'm saying that as a white person with a penis. So I understand. And I'm like six, three and, you know, I'm big. So, like, I understand that's not everybody's, you know, everybody's game. But if that if you don't feel comfortable doing that, making a Facebook post, making an Instagram, Instagram post, TikTok, it doesn't matter. Twitter, um, like just talk about it and don't spend that five dollars there. Don't spend that seventeen dollars and twenty five cents there bleed them out like they they do have money to keep the building but they need the money from the business to 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 really thrive there and that's another thing like they're all about expansion if it's not doing well they're not gonna keep it and so and they'll have to come out with some other game you know maybe and that could change but that's what i would say just The Assemblies of God calls LGBTQ people, they, they say that we have a spiritual disorder. And that to me, I'm sorry, I can't swear on wider, but that messes me up so bad in my head as someone who grew up in the Northern, in a Northern Baptist church and I went there for 19 years, like um, almost got married, all this stuff. Like, just don't spend your money there. And if you know someone that is, and even if they don't know, like, don't guilt them, educate them. There's such a thin line between education and shame, but walk it, it's worth it. That's true. And, and again, always, always, uh, you know, I, we always stress like educate people, you know, and you know, do it, do it. it. It's amazing what, what you can do when you just like, you know, hey, here's a thing you might not know. Um, and like, like I said, you know, that, thank you for bringing me back to ground level. That is, that is a very important, and concrete way people can really engage with this. Um, I want to thank you again so much for taking time out of your schedule to, to come on the show and talk about this for all the research you've done. Um, again, anybody listening, all the links that uh, Casey was talking about, we'll have those those linked here on, on Facebook and the podcast and all that good stuff. Um, anything else before we wrap up? Just thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about stuff with this all right, thank you, and all listeners, stay tuned. Keep on fighting for that revolution solution, and thank you again, Casey, for coming on the program. Mm -hmm. All right, hello, everybody. So anyway, that was our interview with Casey Groton from Second Wave Media. Really illuminating material, talking about Radiant Church. Again, uh, the summary, a bunch of businesses closed down, local businesses closed down on the walking mall because of uh, the pandemic and other reasons. Uh, Radiant Church bought up a bunch of properties down there, got these very conservative uh, anti-LGBTQ uh, views. And again, we'll be posting that interview up on all of our web stuff. Look for it on our uh, probably be a podcast episode later this week. And um, again, if we will make sure to put all of those links up there well, i'm joined by my co-host lawrence and uh another just another quick reminder we're going to be talking about the big issue uh, the great breaking news that dropped last night absolutely just another reminder though we've got some uh we've got a really good podcast episode that where we deep dive into the history of the anti-abortion movement and organizing against it that's episode three of our podcast i actually just put a link up to it uh again on our Facebook page. So, yeah, you want some want some background information, some history, some homework. Uh, it's up there for y'all. But, um, uh, yeah, uh, I'm glad to be here with everybody. Glad today, the last, the last few hours, uh, we have, me and Andy's been uh, talking about uh, doing this show uh, more than just once a week uh, because 
there's stories like this and other stories that we just don't get to. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, like the other the other big news of the story. Like I don't know if you saw or, or uh, like there's a couple big news things outside of the Supreme Court thing. Uh, Russia uh, claiming that they will be uh, instead of saying that it is a military operation or special special ar- army operation that they're going to be declaring war on Ukraine within the next month like that that's crazy um Germany uh Germany talking uh talking about uh, uh putting a ban on Russian oil even though a quarter of their energy comes from Russian oil mm-hmm. so there's a lot of international news that we definitely have to talk about but man the thing that we the thing that we all said was going to happen happened <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, those of us who've been paying attention, um, we've been talking about like uh, Roe Ro versus Wade is going to be, you know, um, basically overruled probably by the summer, and in uh, in a very unprecedented move, we've we've gotten a leak. Uh, somebody leaked out the uh, draft opinion on it, and it is very much a worst case scenario. I think there was some debate about whether they would just overturn it outright or like do something procedural, but. Uh, as we were chit-chatting a little bit during that last interview, um, not only does it overturn Roe v. Wade, but like uh, the the um, justification, legal justifications it gives, kind of opens the window to scaling back other uh, cases that really touched on fundamental rights here in the U.S. And, and yeah. So let's so so let's let's break down so let's break down the leak. First of all. Um, Justice, uh, um, uh, the I forgot, I forgot the man, uh, Alito. Alito, Alito, yeah. Alito, uh, wrote a an opinion, and as as it was written by uh, the woman from the Post, Alito wrote the opinion, and the other the other justices are gonna have a chance to respond to it and all and all that wonderful information. Uh, this is coming from Politico. Um, the they're saying that Rowan, uh, they're saying that Roe and Casey should be overturned, and that uh, Roe and Casey uh, must be overturned. Justice Alito writes in uh, and in, in, in initial majority draft. Uh, Inside, uh, you know, inside this court. Now, there are two things that I'm seeing from a lot of uh, media heads and media talk that's going on. One thing is that this is unprecedented. Like, oh my God, the decorum. That doesn't matter in this particular case. Now, is it is it wrong and is it against the norms that uh, a ruling that is still being a uh, uh, ju- uh, Adjudicated, uh, like the, the court is still listening to, and that their decision won't won't actually be coming out until the summer. Is that information uh, being leaked unprecedented? Yes, it is. But just like the Pentagon Papers, just like the Afghanistan Papers, just like uh, the Panama Papers, just like uh, the WikiLeaks uh, uh, dumps. Uh, that's the 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 fact that uh, these the leak happened and that it's unprecedented and goes against norms. Yes, yes, that is it's uh it's not uh, it is I will I don't I'm not even gonna say that it's a bad thing in my opinion. I believe that the public deserve to know this information. Um, is it probably gonna get somebody fired? Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh yeah, one of the clerks. Whoever did it, that clerk is getting is going. They they getting that clerk all the way out of here. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But at the same time, it's the information that's inside the leak that uh, that matters. So he goes he goes on to uh, to in the dissenting opinion to use um, some right wing junk junk uh, some right wing garbage oh I'm glad you brought up <laughs> I got a few things to say on this too oh yeah no go, go, ahead. go ahead go ahead go ahead no you go ahead and I'll well th- just a couple things I wanted to point out um, engaging in some uh, 
It's some incorrect history here. So, again, comparing it to Plessy v. Ferguson, I, I, I'll let you talk. That's, that's probably the most bonkers thing here. Um, one thing I did want to point out, Alito, he claimed that proponents of abortions are eugenicists who are, quote-unquote, motivated by a desire to suppress the size of the African-American population. And... This actually like he uses, oh, he uses Clarence yeah. Thomas. Uh, he uses Clarence Thomas as uh, as the reasoning for that logic, yeah, which yeah. is mm-hmm. hilarious. <laughs> yeah, uh, and I want to point a couple things out. Like right, right wingers have they've done this as like a weird um, kind of pick, like just picking and choosing like bits of history about around abortion to push this mythology that it was part of some sort of scheme to. Uh, you know, uh, shrink the African American population, which historically we, we've seen. You know, as as long as anti-abortion issues have been an issue, they have gone hand in glove with constituencies that usually have more are whiter and have more racial bias. So, again, if you tune into our episode three of our podcast, we go into that more in depth. So there's that. But I also want to point out, it's like. Uh, yes. Now, let, when we're talking about some of the initial, like Margaret Sanger is one that's brought up a lot, and she had some pretty gross views on race. That is absolutely true. Uh, at the same time, uh, Margaret Sanger was not the only person pushing for abortion, and abortion is an international issue, and they, though, abortion is typically championed by a, you know, a, a, sorry, <clears throat> excuse me. A broad coalition of people of people of all races, um, you know, um, you know, genders and the like, and it's about again, it's about women's bodily autonomy. But so by like playing this little shell game, it's like pointing at one particular, uh, a, um, you know, anti-abortion figure, and it's like looking at look look at this racism that they had, while uh, you know, again, obscuring the racism inherent to the anti or to sorry to the, to the pro-life movement. And their their own etymology is like again it's st- uh, as we talked about in that pod- last podcast, a lot of it started from the same same kinds of uh, thinking that like we're trying to divorce um, these private Christian co- colleges from having to abide by um, uh, you know uh, desegregation rulings. So uh, uh, yeah, uh, again it's they're playing a funny little shell game with history. That's what Alito is doing here. Go, go ahead, Lawrence. Well, I mean, even even so, I don't like to straw man. I don't like to straw man people's arguments. Let's say, for the sake of argument, that that uh, that that's true. That the people who um, that uh, was fighting for abortion rights back in the day, uh, uh, not given the context that during that same time they were lynching black folks. So you want to talk about black? You want to talk about? Um, uh, killing off the black population uh, The American government Was doing that w- uh, Has has been Doing that It was doing that uh, Way before uh, The ideology Or thought process that We're going to kill black babies with abortion But let's say that, that Let's say that that's true Let's say let, let's, let's give them that argument So how does that information affect a black woman today who was raped or a black woman today who may be um, uh, not in a financial situation to not just have the baby, but then raise the baby? Or what if the life of the mother uh, is in danger? Well, in certain, well, so, certain so, states, uh, she'll get prosecuted for murder. For yeah, so and we, and we life, talked. So, yeah. We literally talked about a story like that yeah. in Texas yeah. of a woman who had who who uh, self induced gave herself a self induced abortion because uh, of the circumstances of what was of how of how she got pregnant, and they put her in jail. So. If it's incest, if it's rape, if it's uh, if it's just a woman 
who's not financially stable enough to uh, keep the ba- to, uh, to keep the baby or to raise the baby. You're telling me because people were racist back in what was it? Their early twenties, nineteen twenties. So you're telling me before the Great Depression, people were racist, and because those people were racist towards black folks, we should take away the freedom of choice, the freedom of liberty, the freedom of autonomy from women today. You remember, you remember, these are the same people during the pandemic who didn't want to put on a mask and would say, my body, my choice. Mm, yeah. I also just want to, like, <laughs> uh, here's another example just to show how ridiculous this example is. You know what other uh, activist group in the early uh, 20th century was also, had, had a lot of, like, racist white people in it. The 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 uh, the suffrage movement and like I, I have this a, a lot of the main organizations that were fighting for women's right to vote Susan B Anthony so yeah they explicitly wanted to disinclude black women because they didn't want the baggage of them a lot of them were explicitly racist so it's that same if you were to apply that same logic it's like you know what we should repeal the women's right to vote because some of those people fighting for <laughs> that right were racist. So, I mean, I mean, uh, if we're, I mean, if I'm going by that, if I, if I'm going by that logic, you know, uh, that means the first and second amendment should also be repealed uh, by that logic, mm-hmm. because the first and second amendment was written by people who said, uh, remember the, remember in the Constitution uh, or in the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Yeah. Um, the man who wrote that owned slaves. And, like, the Second Amendment itself, you know, is, uh, I mean, it was largely written so that militias could arm themselves to quell slave rebellions. Like, that's, that's like, the subtext of the Second Amendment. So, 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 so not to distract, not to distract. So, outside of that, um, so, it's a dumb argument to, to say because again, I want Republicans to be logical here. People back in the 1920s were racist, and because that or that organization was a part of eugenics and was racist, uh, we should not. Uh, we should take away people's rights uh, uh, and autonomy over their bodies. Okay, cool. So that means you're by that same logic that the police departments that were created because of uh, 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 they were created out of slave patrols mm-hmm. in the South and in the North that are directly linked to slave patrols. We should dismantle those. We should dismantle those uh, uh, organizations because their past is racist. Mm-hmm. The FBI. The FBI has uh, the FBI uh, Co- uh, Tail Pro. Or uh, what they did. What they did to the. Uh, during, uh, to the civil rights movement, the the letters that they sent to Mal- uh, to Martin Luther King to, uh, to to kill himself because of his because he had extramarital affairs, we should dismantle that organization mm-hmm. because it was racist in the past. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah, mm-hmm. wait. You're not you're not for any of that. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to. You don't want none of that smoke. Yeah. But a woman being able to have bodily autonomy over their bodies. You, uh, you're for also, and this is the other thing that, uh, for me in particular, was pissing me off. The coded language that he was using, uh, because uh, in using his religion to want to justify taking away women women's rights as a Christian, it bothers me. It bothers the hell out of me because one. The Bible is actually pro-abortion, and that's um, that's an important point. And before you, I just quick <laughs> aside, uh, just even because th- you know it always come back Republicans, and, and you know a lot of your family members kind of be it's like I just want them to stop the baby killing. And it's like it wasn't until like the seventies that mainline of evangelical Christianity started pushing that abortion was murder. For much of history, it was like kind of it was like only like Catholics really thought that, and most. Most theologians did not interpret abortion as as, as the murder of a child. Um, Hold on, but the other the other part of it is the question that we've always had in this country, and the question that we've always uh, discussed was 
Uh, viability. Mm. When is viability? And we've always discussed when is viability. When the zygote or the fetus is still in the woman's womb and that fetus would not survive outside of the woman's room or that zygote would not survive outside of the woman's room which is still just a cluster of cells then it's not viable it's not a viable living breathing human being and when it when that zygote or fetus does become a viable would be a viable living breathing human being outside of the womb then you had then states could have regulations on late term abortion mm-hmm. if you if you find that what i just said was reasonable yeah that was wade roe v wade basically said before viability so uh the first trimester that baby is that that zygote that fetus is not a viable uh human being it's not a it's not a viable it's not a viable uh living embryo that that zygote still has a tail do y'all how many humans have you seen walking around here with tails (laughs) <laughs> that are not furries no. okay <laughs> like, like you, you know what I'm saying so and if you think if you think that's uh, 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 there's a great debate between Ben Bur- uh, Bridges and Charlie Kirk uh, uh, Ben Burr and Charlie Kirk where he shows up he shows two pictures to Charlie Kirk um, of two different babies at six months Right, mm-hmm. uh, and he asked. He asked Charlie. He was like, "Charlie, do human beings have tails?" <laughs> and he's like, "And Charlie's like, what you mean?" I was like, "No, do human do babies and human beings have tails?" Mm-hmm. He's like, "No." He said, "At six weeks, a uh, a zygote has a tail." And he showed up two pictures. He was like, "Do you?" Th-? He was. He showed him. Uh, he was like, "Do you think that this?" Uh, is a living, breathing baby, and Charlie was like, "Absolutely." He was like, "This is a dolphin fetus." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. And then he, then he goes into his file and pulls up another picture, and it looks exactly like the dolphin fetus. You yeah. could not, you mm-hmm. cannot tell the difference. Mm-hmm. I'll be like, and so it may, it makes me laugh when I, it makes me angry. And it makes it just. I'm going on this long rant. So that, like, so. The, but the point that I was getting to was, as a Christian, it makes me angry because it goes back to the. Uh, it goes back to the whole thing about viability. That was what Roe was about. When is the baby viable, and or uh, to live outside of the mother's womb? And if it's not, then the lady still has the autonomy over her body to do what she would like to do, do what they would like to do with their body and as a christian if you don't believe me that the bible is full, pro-abortion i would like for you to open up your bibles to numbers chapter 5 verses 11 through 31 yahweh at this time because it's uh, god god tells uh moses because moses wrote the first five books in the bible numbers one of the first five books of the bible said if your lady uh if the man suspects that their lady is pregnant by another uh by another man take take that woman to the temple uh give offerings to the uh priest the priest will give uh will give uh will uh do with the offerings as they will and they will give the woman uh bitter water that will have them miscarry uh, I'm giving you I'm paraphrasing but that's the that's the whole thing uh, a a man will take their uh, take their wife to the temple to get bitter water that will not harm the woman but will uh, but will miscarry the pregnancy mm-hmm. a woman goes to a location gets some medicine and then no longer has a baby mm-hmm. what is that in modern times a woman goes to a doctor, give offer, give them a offering, which is money, mm-hmm. gets a pill, and then doesn't have a baby. Yep. Mm-hmm. 
So I think like that, you, you're bringing that for a very important reason. I know a lot of y'all are probably going to be having a lot of tough conversations with family members, and I think those are really the two big things to bring up. You know, Lawrence just sketched out like that's a theological basis for arguing against the the anti-abortion movement, and some of the history that we talk about. Again, going back to that podcast talking about how abortion. Was very kind of cynically and deliberately chosen as a wedge issue back in the late 70s to drum up evangelical votes. If you point those two things out, you know, you might not be able to, like, you know, change someone's mind, but I think you can at least get them start thinking about these things. Also, if your way. argument is saying that people in the past were racist to uh, uh, African Americans <coughs> or just, or, or had the plot to genocide uh, to genocide a race of people. Uh, America, please remind them that America has done their best to genocide uh, races of people throughout its history. Mm-hmm. If we're talking about the Native American genocide, or we're talking about uh, the North, if we're talking about the North Atlantic slave trade. Don't even get us started on how they treated uh, how they treated uh, 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 Mexican people and and Latin people. And uh, y'all don't even want to get me started on how they treated um, Asian Americans, especially Japanese Americans with Japanese internment camps, or the Irish or Italians when they came here as immigrants. So let's not let's not get it twisted. Using those old arguments to justify the authoritative and and overreach of the government uh, controlling a woman's body is one creepy and two dumb. Mm-hmm. Of course, they flip it around, and uh, one of this all goes back to that that favorite right wing canard of states' rights. Um, in the decision, it talks about it's time to heed the Constitution and return the issue of abortion to the people's elected representatives, and that means taking it back to the states. Uh, so, obviously, you want to read, keep reading from read some of the article? Oh, you go ahead. Um, this is from Josh Gerstein uh, and Alexander Ward. The Supreme Court has uh, voted... The Supreme Court has... Uh, has voted to strike down the landmark uh, Roe v. Wade decision, according to additional uh, uh, intentional draft majority opinion written by Justice uh, Samuel Alito, uh, circulated inside the court uh, and obtained by Politico. Let me stop there. You remember how during Amy Amy Coney Barrett and uh, and the other justice. Uh, the, the rapist justice um, how these Republican justices kept saying that they the biggest thing that they care about is precedent well that's right yeah. remember how they kept saying that they, they we care about precedent <laughs> we 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 care about we care about uh, precedent and then they overturn precedent uh, in this country but uh, I, I digress um the draft, uh, the draft opens. Uh, the draft, uh, the draft opinion is a full-throated, unflinching uh, repudiation of the 1973 decision, which grants federal constitutional protection of abortion rights, and and a uh, sub- in subsequent 1992 decision of uh, Planned Parenthood versus Casey, the largely. Uh, the largely uh, maintained the right role uh, was uh, in uh, the, the, they're quoting role was enormously wrong from the start. Alito wrote it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Um, I want to just read real brief. There's this a good breakdown of the implications of this. We talked about this a little closer to the top where, you know, the, this uh, we we're talking about precedent. This is a very bad precedent for a number of other issues. Uh, I think the World Socialist website really just brings the point home here. Just going to read real briefly. Uh, so, you know, by this rationale that, you know, Roe v. Wade wasn't in the Constitution, 
Very little stops today's court from reversing almost all of the decisions of the court's brief liberal period of the 50s to early 70s. This includes the right to a public defender, the right of arrestees to hear the constitu- constitutional rights read to them upon arrest, the abolition, the, you know, the abolition of anti-miscegenation laws, that means like interracial marriage, the ban on mandatory prayers in, in public schools. The decision even opens the door to overturning the court's prior decision holding that the Equal Protection Clause applies not only to the actions of the federal government, but also to the governments of the states. Uh, which uh, the so- so- uh, the, uh, the sodomy laws say the, the, mm-hmm. uh, that that uh, that the courts have uh, obtained. Same thing with uh, Brown versus the Board of Education, uh, and, and also recently the court upholding uh, gay marriage. Yeah. If mm-hmm. it, uh, if you don't think that the Supreme Court won't be going after these other rights, they just prove to you that they don't care about precedent. Mm-mm. They, uh, the the social progress that our country has achieved slowly over the la- uh, over decades of struggle can swiftly be erased within a matter of within a matter of a couple years. See, when all these conservatives talk about like turning back the clock to the 1950s, they they really mean it. Yeah. Uh, so, oh man. Uh, uh, so real quick, y'all listening to 89.1 WIDR or online at widerfm.org. Just a quick reminder: uh, you can find us on Facebook, YouTube. We've got a podcast, Media Safers Kalamazoo, and don't forget, you can go to the wider website. You can find uh, you know uh, get, get, help the station out. Give it, you know, click that donate button. You know, use the pennies. We're going to be getting the new studio soon. So. Um, so there's one thing that I definitely want to talk about with uh, with these laws and yeah. uh, the gut. It was the um, it was the uh, where is it? The gut uh, gut macker gut gut mi- uh, uh, gut muncher uh, meter muncher or I, I keep I keep saying this wrong. Hey, it's all right. But. Uh, it's a it's an institute that it was an institute that was studying that was studying the um, uh, I, uh, it was an institute that was studying how many states were have uh, enacted um, uh, or, or had or had pre roll ban laws. Targeted oh. laws, no, uh, near total ban laws, six week ban laws, eight week ban laws, and constitutional uh, ban protections, uh, and also the states that are likely to ban abortions if Roe v. Wade has uh, o- o- is overturned. Mm-hmm. So between thirteen and twenty six states. Mm-hmm. Let me read them. Let me read these states for you. Um, Alabama, Arizona, Arkansas, Georgia, Iowa, uh, Iowa, uh, Idaho, Iowa, Kentucky, uh, Louisiana, Michigan, Mississippi, Missouri, North Dakota, Ohio, uh, Oklahoma, South, uh, South Carolina, South Dakota, Tennessee, Texas, Utah, West Virginia, Wisconsin, Wyoming, Florida, Indiana, uh, Montana and Nebraska. Did you, did you did you mention Michigan on that list? Yes, I did. Yes, it did. Yeah. Michigan. Yeah, that's that's important, and that's that's something we really want to talk to y'all about today because again, that's where we live, and it's based on there is a 1931 law on the books. It is currently dormant, but if Roe versus Wade is overturned, it would legally our state would roll back to that precedent which makes abortion in the state of Michigan uh, illegal and criminalized. Um, now, other people have noticed this. Uh, the, the governor uh, has been uh, trying to work with the Michigan Supreme Court to declare it a constitutional right. Um, the Dana Nassell has vowed that she is not going to prosecute any abortion cases. And uh, um, very, very specifically, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the leaked. Oh, I'm sorry. There's a, there's a part down here that really dives into the counties, and it's important, I think, for me to hit on it. But um, 
All right. Well, I was going to say, um, I'll, I'll find that information uh, for y'all, but um, they, their prosecutors in, in various counties where Democrats control uh, or are in charge uh, have vowed not to prosecute those local clinics. Um, at Kalamazoo is one of those. Uh, but uh, it's also worth pointing out uh, Republican legislators uh, here in the state of Michigan have blocked Democrats' efforts to repeal that old law. Um, oh, yeah, and yeah, Democratic prosecutors in seven counties with abortion clinics in turn have pledged not to enforce it. However, there are six counties in Michigan with clinics that have Republican prosecutors. And uh, one other thing to point out, though, is not all is necessarily lost. So here's a big problem. Roe v. Wade is overturned sometime in the next couple of months. Um, abortion will be illegal in Michigan. However, this decision does not make just it does not make abortion federally illegal. It, quote unquote, leaves it up to the states. And there is a ballot petition going around right now. Uh, the Reproductive Freedom for All uh, petition. To be, uh, and they need to collect about 425,000 uh, voter signatures by July, July 11th in order to appear, appear on the Michigan ballot. And so, if they get the signatures they need, that is going to be on November's ballot. And it could be up to the people of Michigan to make abortion legal in our state again. Uh, and as of recent recent opinion polling in Michigan, about 70% of voters said the Supreme Court should leave Roe v. Wade as it is, and about 27% said it should overturn the decision. So, I mean, uh, Gallup poll did a poll of of, of of the opinion on abortion, and over uh, 70% of the country believes that Roe v. Wade should be left alone. Um, I think it was 68% that thought that uh, uh, it was, I think it was like 60, it was 60 to 68% that said um, abortion should be legal and uh, it was only 20, uh, 28% of the country that said that uh, abortion should be illegal yeah. in, in the United States. So the overwhelming majority of the country agrees that abortion should be um that abortion should be legal in this country because what's going to happen because like when we think of when we think about the actual ramifications of what's going to happen the red states and those states that that i read the the 20 the 26 states that i read are going to enact laws that will disproportionately hurt poor disenfranchised people especially people of color. Um, and what is that going to do? That means more women will end up... That means women who had to deal with incest, women that had to deal with rape, women who are not financially stable and uh, and just ends up, ha it ends up getting pregnant are going to have a choice. Stuck with a dilemma. Either get some money... Uh, and fly to a state that is legal that that will legally do abortions or bring the, a baby to term that they may not be medically that they may end up dying in the process because let's also be clear black women have the highest uh, uh, black women in particular I think have the highest rate of dying during childbirth so it so we have multiple cases of more women being traumatized, being uh, uh, being traumatized emotionally, uh, medically, physically, and 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 being being uh, having their liberty and freedom taken away because of other religious zealots. That and it's not going to stop wealthy Republicans or wealthy women from getting abortions because they're going to do so anyway. Oh yeah. The the mm -hmm. the 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 white Republicans who cheat on their spouses 
uh, will always be able to fly their mistresses out to California or, or anywhere to have so that they can have their procedures. Mm-hmm. The rest of y'all, the rest of y'all gonna be hurt. So I just did want to put a cap on it. So again, if you live in Michigan, I've got like some some bad news and some slightly good news, which is to say, you know, God, this is bad. Uh, Michigan. Uh, will effectively have a legal abortion ban uh, in in a couple months, most likely. But, ray of light at the end of the tunnel, come November, we may have a chance to overturn that. Uh, But it really just depends on this circulating petition to get enough signatures. So I would recommend, if you are incensed about this, one of the big, big, biggest things I would recommend you do, get involved in either circulating these petitions, make sure you've signed it if you haven't, um, and then November, I know, I know I'm like the, 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 you know, revolution now guy, but there are times where we really got to engage in some form of harm reduction and like voting to to keep abortion legal in Michigan in November. Like everybody needs to vote. Everybody, everybody this, this fall. Um, so with that, just again, that's what it means to people in Michigan. Now, what can people do about it? I want to kind of. Uh, close the loop on this topic. We've been chatting about it, hopefully giving it as much attention as it deserves. Um, one thing you should be uh, keep your eyes out for in the coming weeks and months, mutual aid networks are going to be really critical and important. And this is like ground level, like helping people, you know, financially uh, supporting people get, getting to states that still will be able to perform abortions, that kind of stuff. Um, I also wanted to talk about... Um, the fact that what could the Democratic Party be doing? <sighs> well, they could, they could, and I really want to put a point on this because the mainstream media is probably not going to point this out. And uh, aside from a few progressives in Congress, everybody's pretending this is just something you can't do. Like uh, uh, Bernie Sanders, for example, just came out and said this. Um, you, the Democratic Party, they control the executive branch. They control both Houses of Congress. Here is what they could do today. Today, if they wanted. They could pass a law making, you know, enshrining Roe v. Wade across the land. And they could do it with their majorities in Congress if they overturned the filibuster. They could have 50 votes. They could do this now. In the Senate, you mean nine Congress? In the Senate. And, well, in the, yeah, in the Senate. Yeah. But I'm saying, like, they have the numbers they need to pass this legislation. They have the president. They have both both uh, the House and the Senate. If they do not do it, it is an absolute because you know we're going to be hearing from a lot of like blue no matter who liberals like this is why it's important to vote. And let me make it clear. People voted as hard as they could in 2020. We had, like, the biggest voter turnout in, like, 50 years. So many people came out to, A, stop Donald Trump, and and B, uh, maybe get some crumbs from the Democratic Party. (laughs) Didn't get nearly as many crumbs as people expected. But if they cannot use their majorities to protect a basic and fundamental right, you know, shame on them. Like, and, you know, not only that, could they be doing that? With the with you know, also by overturning the filibuster, they could be more ambitious. They could put more justices on the Supreme Court. They could enact different uh, you know other legislation. Maybe getting some term limits or something in there. They are choosing not to do this because you know the arguments of people like Joe Manchin is like, oh well, we shouldn't uh, buck you know congressional precedent. We shouldn't re- repeal the filibuster, which again was a rather recent invention that was literally designed to uh, protect. Uh, states' rights to uh, discriminate against black folks. So, um, just, in in particular, the filibuster was created to uh, to to for, so the majority could have uh, could go against an, uh, the minority could go against anti lynching laws. That's actually the history of the filibuster. It was racist by design. Um, yeah. Uh, AOC said the same thing. Elizabeth Warren also said the same thing. They they said multiple tweets. Even Hillary Clinton came out and said that it was it and was uh, it was uh, um, Hillary Clinton is basically the definition of the American center politics. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and even even Hillary Clinton said that you know it's not it wasn't um, 
It's not shocking. It, it's it's utterly. It was utterly disgusting, but it wasn't shocking. Like it was expected. Yeah. But the thing is, is that I just want to. It, it goes to the fecklessness of our body politics, and especially when it comes to our our representatives not representing us. How many presidents said that they was going to codify uh, the codify Roe mm-hmm. v. Wade? Uh, even during our lifetime, bro, uh, I'm a I'm a eighty I'm a eighties baby. Yeah. Yet, I remember Clinton saying that he he would protect women's rights. Uh, I remember President Obama saying that he would codify Roe v. Wade. He had a supermajority. Uh, I think you can even go all the way back to Jimmy Carter. How many times did you hear heard? Uh, saying that we will codify Roe v. Wade, we will protect women's rights to uh, to have autonomy over their bodies, um, and nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing. Um, I think the other, the other, the other issue for me is that I, I, I well, there, there was two, there was two things that I saw that was that was making me very, very disgusted. One, the Republicans and right wing. Using this to say, um, using the leak and saying that uh, this leak is going to cause an insurrection and in, of, of protest. <laughs> they said that. The dog. <laughs> ben Shapiro, uh, Marjorie Green, a bunch of Fox News people uh, was already on it. They were on it. Tommy Lauren, they were on it, saying that this leak. Uh, it was designed. It was designed to uh, to cause an insurrection, or and that's an what the insurrection. Because they, they wouldn't know anything about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so when I saw that, I was like, I was like, dog, y'all are tripping. I was like, bro, y'all, y'all lost your minds. Right, you know, actually, I should say, I mean, they, they, they they're probably your foremost experts on insurrections. Yeah. So, so, so <laughs> when I saw that, I was like, okay, that's. I was like, oh okay, y'all are y'all are dumb. Right. I, I don't got time. I ain't got time for. I ain't got time <laughs> yeah. to listen to y'all. Y'all are just stupid. Um, yeah, they're probably. But, I mean, they're probably referencing. You know, to be serious for a moment. You know, they're probably referencing. Uh, kind of bringing back the specter of the 2020 uprisings. Yeah, you know, that's um, what that's that's yeah. what they're saying. They were yeah. saying that those that those protests were mm-hmm. insurrections, yeah. quote unquote. Oh no, and, somebody might break a window. <laughs> yeah. You know, oh no. So I'm just <laughs> so it, it it makes me it makes me and then I I see that insanity on the right, but then I see the fecklessness on the left cuz I'm like, okay, People should use their First Amendment right to protest mm-hmm. and to sit and to tell the court, "Nah, y'all tripping. What are you doing? Stop we're, we're, it." <laughs> worth noting too, more cops got hurt uh, during the J6 insurrection during the entire summer <laughs> of uh, uh, the 2020 uh, uprising. So just le- uh, just letting you know, like, you know, uh, who's, but, who's really doing the violence here, right? But and and the other thing that that was making me upset was that. Democrats, when, when cause we were talking about this about about 2020, and I can see, and I saw some political pundits saying this is going to rile up the base. So I'm like, we're going to take away the autonomy. They're taking away the autonomy of of women in this country to control their own bodies, and we're going to use that. To get votes And I'm like Yeah we need to vote like our lives depend on it I tr- I agree with that But as of right now They need to govern Like our lives depend on it yeah. They need to fight for us Like our lives Depend on it In, in many cases there will be women that will be that will be harmed and that will possibly die well, because of this. I think one of the things that makes you know, what, what concerns me is like we saw how in 2020 uh, the Democratic Party really tried to co-opt uh, Black Lives Matter and uh, the the uprising that summer in order to um, get more votes in the ele- the election. I do, I do, I am concerned they might do the same thing with abortion, where they'll say it's they like, are. hey, if you want to. If you want to you know, reestablish abortion rights, you all got to vote for us. Make sure we win in the midterms, and 
let's say like all against all odds they win the midterms and then they don't do anything about it like this oh man joe manchin will still be there like ah, i'm not gonna st- eliminate filibuster my uh, thing is <laughs> my thing in the, and that's the thing like no they're not gonna get us they're not gonna mm-hmm. get 60 republic they're not going to get 60 republicans to um they're not gonna uh, get 60 votes so yeah 10 they're not gonna get 60 and, votes they're not gonna get 10 republicans yeah. to join they're gonna have to Get rid of the filibuster so that women can have autonomy over their bodies. Mm-hmm. And if you're a woman and you you live in West Virginia, now might be the time to like, West Virginia. Like it also, get, get, hey hey, <laughs> holla at Kristen Cinema too. Yeah. Do you really think? Like I don't think we, I haven't heard her response to this, but do you think she's still holding the line on the filibuster after this? You oh yes. Think that, a- absolutely. One hundred percent. Because. <laughs> She, dog, she's teaching a class on how to sell out to donors. Ah, uh, that's true. That's... She's literally teaching a class on how to sell out to donors. I forgot that she sold her soul, folks. There's a great, right. there's a great uh, Jacobin article talking about how she used to be like a Green Party activist, and then she literally just oh, cashed you talking in about all the, ja- chips. the Jacobin article. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, just... yeah bruh. <laughs> so I should, I should not hold out for Kristen Cinema to so, get her soul back. Okay, <laughs> so. Uh, Okay, so there's a few there's a few other things, a few quick things, because we, we've been talking about this for like the last hour. So there's a few quick things. First of all, free Britney Griner. I'm saying that now since we're, we have to move to another topic before we have to get out of here. Free Britney Griner. She's uh, been lawfully she's been lawfully uh, de- uh, detained, unlawfully detained in um, in Russia. She's a WNBA basketball player that's been arrested in, in Russia uh, since December, I think. Yeah, free her. We need more. We need more stories, and more of the media needs to talk about her uh, because she's basically a political prisoner, and and they are holding her basically as leverage because of the Ukraine, Ukraine, and stuff like that because of Russia giving weapons to Ukraine. And Russia feels like they could use her as a pawn against us. So, but she should be freed. Um, that that's that that's one thing. Also, today's primary day, folks, mm-hmm. folks, folks. There are a bunch of progressives that are running. That uh, to, today's it's in today that we need to vote for. The one in particular that I'm talking about, that I've, that I've been talking about ever since I've been on the show, is Nina Turner in Ohio's 11th district running against Chantel Brown. I was absolutely pissed that the Justice Democrats did not endorse Nina Turner this time. That was garbage. I am happy that AOC, you know, did come out and endorse Nina Turner but she did it 12 hours before voting started today. Like, you know what I'm saying? She did it uh, late in the third quarter. Late in the fourth quarter. And that she came out after, after, and this is the thing that I really, I really want to talk about this. I don't know if you saw Mark Pocan's interview on MSNBC. Um, I think it was MSNBC or CNN. Where... Mark Pocan was explaining that the Progressive Caucus had a conversation, they had a vote, and it was a unanimous vote to have the Progressive Caucus endorse their incumbents, which is also Chantel Brown being a corporatist Democrat. Mm -hmm. And AOC finally was like, nah, bruh, nah, bruh, I don't support this. I'm endorsing Nina Turner. And she did it at the last minute. And what it sounds like, what it does sound like, is that, no, there was dissenting votes. There were multiple dissenting votes. But Mark Pocan and Pamela Jaipal won't show the public those votes. And, and or, yeah, the rest of the squad and the rest of the Justice Democrats left the person who they know is a fighter on the majority of policies that they agree with. They are throwing her under a bus because of civility politics Mm -hmm. and letting the Progressive Caucus support a corporate neoliberal who literally have Trump that literally has Trump donors backing her backing her in Chantel Brown. Mm -hmm. Chantel Brown is 
Well, I mean, we talked about it before on this show. She is a she is the definition of everything that we fight against in uh, as as progressive people, as progressive commentators. She takes uh, oil lobby money. She takes uh, super PAC money, corporate lobbyist money, and uh, and she does not support any of the policies that would positively affect uh, their her community, as in Medicare for all, uh, universal free college and tuition, a living wage, a uh, 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 fight for fifteen and a living wage. She's even against the Iran nuclear deal, the Iran nuclear deal, because of the super PAC that's funding her campaign. Like she's, she's a regressive Democrat. She's a regressive Democrat, and that's why we need a leader and a fighter like Nina Turner in it, in Congress, because I guarantee you, if Nina Turner was there in Congress. When progressives are on the ballot, she can rally the rest of the actual justice Democrats to actually stand up and fight for people who we agree with. Mm-hmm. You know, it's something I've been noticing. Like, is he, even uh, since uh, Build Back Better got um, kiboshed, you're really seeing a lot of these erstwhile progressives in Congress just completely waffle. Uh, Ro Khanna comes to mind. He's like, they recently made this statement about uh, Joe Manchin. It's like, oh. we should have simped harder for Joe Manchin. Yeah. <laughs> that was the yeah. problem. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. So when Ro said that uh, Ro, had, Ro has Washington brain, same thing with Pum- Pumilla Jayapal. When they said that we should, he was basically saying that we should play, we should have been playing nicer. We shouldn't be. We shouldn't have been as critical. Mm-hmm. When more perfect union, as of two days ago, put out a video of how Joe Manchin, of uh, oil company, is has uh, is literally polluting the area of his constituents. He knows about it, and they're choosing to do so because he's because he's going to make more profit of, off mm-hmm. of it. Yep. They, more perfect union is doing the Lord's work. Okay, they're doing the work that I wish we could do. <laughs> oh, they are uh, doing the Lord's work. <laughs> quick, quick note: we are talking about primary today. It is an election day. Uh, there, uh, there are two things going. On. It is an election day in Kalamazoo. Also, yes, it is. So there's two things on the ballot if you live in Kalamazoo. There's uh, basically a bonding proposal for Kalamazoo Public Schools, and there's a law enforcement and safety millage renewal. And long and short of it, uh, one is to you know make sure we're raising more tax money for Kalamazoo Public Schools, and one is to raise more money for Kalamazoo Department of Public Safety, i.e. the police. So Boo. I think you can guess how I would vote. <laughs> I'm going to vote today, but uh, uh, I'm going yeah. to tell you. Uh, <laughs> yes, we should raise. Yes, we should be putting more money into Kalamazoo Public Schools, and no, we should not be putting more money into the police. <laughs> yeah, Look, yeah, that's right. my opinion, yeah. and like and like we have also said uh, before the start of the show, the following views and thoughts of of mm, uh, yeah. of uh, this show does not reflect on uh, W uh, 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 WMU. These Western, are all the, yeah. yeah, these are all these are all my personal thoughts. So, um, you know, NWA NW uh, you know, NWA said it best. Um, mm-hmm. you know where I'm going with that. Yeah, and, I, I can't, can't quite say it on the air, but you know, darn the police, I think is what I was going Yeah. Uh, yeah, so yeah. Uh, they get the Archie Bunker Award, you know what I'm saying? The you know what I'm saying? They, that's what they get. They get the RG Bunker Award. Uh, yes, we should be raising taxes for schools. And uh, this is, a, and again, for those who are going to listen to this and uh, be angry, I want you to understand why. Half of the budget that goes into our city, half of that budget already goes to the police department. We got uh, the the big story that got into the paper about how our city is a libertarian's wet dream. We had, f- what, $400 million? Mm-hmm. Uh, talking about the Foundation for Excellence? Yeah. Uh, yeah. We had, we had 400, we had, uh, we had $400 million. Oh, oh, about uh, the, the money that was delegated to the city. And again, that money was 
given to different departments. The overwhelming majority of that money went to the police department. So much so that they that they spent nine they spent uh, what was it nine point two million dollars to uh, to uh, create a new to create a new building to to upgrade their building right. While at the same time, while at the same time in this city, we didn't have money to put into a homeless shelter while we had rampant homelessness in going on in our city. We didn't have uh, we didn't have nowhere near the same amount of money going into mental health counseling, uh, preventative programs, uh, um crisis programs to help people who are having uh who are having issues that do not need police officers and again i'm not hating and this is not me hating on the police this is me uh, just seriously stating that every situation that is happening in kalamazoo and again the police have a tough job they're dealing with people on the worst days of their lives i get that so the best way we can help them be more effective in their job is to take the take some stress off of their work by delegating some of their work to people who uh who can deal with mental health and other crises that do not need a gun Mm -hmm. that is the best way to not to not just not that's that uh, that's the best way to not just secure the longevity and physical and mental health of our police officers that's also the best way to protect the citizens that they're supposed to be serving Mm -hmm. it it's it's a win-win on both sides so no you already got enough money make it work with what you got (laughs) i feel that and uh well, we're at about 2 o'clock, Lawrence. Um, I, I might have time for a few extra innings here, but uh, I didn't really have too much else. I know um, there's a lot we didn't get to on the show today because, again, the breaking news from yesterday, we really wanted to give that topic the time it deserved. And, uh, again, the, the I will I will drop, drop down some links to that ballot petition that's circulating to uh, protect abortion rights in Michigan come November. Uh, the bad news, of course, being it is very, very likely that Roe versus Wade will be getting overturned. Um, uh, uh, okay, so we're going to talk about some quick hits. I, I also have a couple quick hits. Yeah, so you go ahead. Yeah. So, um, I mean, uh, status quo, that is um, well, Jordan Sheridan's outlet uh, independent media outlet they are they've been doing a lot of stuff when it comes to uh, their their channel has talked about the Flint water crisis they actually talked about uh, Kalamazoo as well when it came I, to I the environmental racism they did a piece of, on uh, graphic packaging yeah, talked about last yes week. absolutely and um, they had another piece they had another piece that uh, that they were doing uh in Flint and talked about uh, Stephen Danzinger the lawyer who was arrested because he beat Chevron and and uh, when Chevron was poisoning uh, indigenous people's lands he beat them in court and then they arrested him for that so they have a piece talking about that and how that also is affecting people in how that decision also echoes and affects the people in Flint because of new lawsuits that's going on in Flint, which uh, is a fantastic piece. I don't, ha- we don't have time to get into it, but I encourage everybody to check that out. But the Kellogg story. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, when I read that article, I wanted to talk about that. Let go ahead, because you don't want to put it in the chat. Okay, well, uh, so the <laughs> Intercept dropped the story. They got some uh, uh, leaked uh, audio, or that is, uh, and uh, let, let me pull it up real quick. But the gist of it is. It's the same sort of. I mean, I guess in a way, it's good news. We, we've got we've got the bosses running scared. Is this what it boils down to? But um, Ken Hurley, the vice president of human resources and labor relations at Kellogg, um, spoke about uh, his his perception of uh, what's going on with the union. 
Uh, so, in my view, he said, the union leadership at the bargaining table table were behaving more like terrorists than partners. And he, he, he says that um, the bakery, confectionery, tobacco workers, and grain mills international union, which represented workers at Kellogg's, really became somewhat intoxicated, <laughs> intoxicated by other strikes last year, including work stoppages at plants owned by Frito-Lay and Nabisco. I mean... Uh, to to bring to you know to talk stop, about okay, stop, stop, yeah, stop, yeah. stop 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 <laughs> the vice president of the vice president in charge of union negotiations called the people who are asking for better pay equity in a more fair and balanced workplace he called them terrorists. <laughs> You call the workers who make your products so that you can make money terrorists. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's since been fired. Uh, Obviously. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look, at, look at God. Won't yeah. they do it? Yeah. Okay? Won't mm -hmm. God do it? Look at God. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, a couple things to point out. It's like, one... You, you see this this very scared rhetoric from him and people like Howard Schultz who are talking about like being assaulted by unions and it's like these these billionaires really are not used to workers sticking up for themselves. It's been a long time since we've had a strong labor movement in the United States, so it's something very alien and, and unfamiliar with. And it's interesting to talk about like being intoxicated by you know drawing inspiration from workers at Frito Lay and Nabisco and you know the Deer Tractor employees, etc. And describing that as being intoxicated, like we're, <laughs> I'm, get, I'm getting drunk off of some worker solidarity here, Lawrence. Oh man, um, uh, that's my favorite beverage. Uh, absolutely, goes really good with my uh, billionaire tears, you know. Oh, yeah. um, so, see, uh, doc, it makes me, it makes me laugh thinking about and looking at when, I, when. Okay, so we talked about the Applebee story. Where the the CEO of Applebee's talked about, hey, the the uh, inflation is better for our um, is better for us because workers we can uh, pay workers less money during this pandemic while they're struggling. Mm -hmm. That got leaked, which is a reason why I haven't eaten at Applebee's in a very long time. Yeah. Um. I guess uh, I do want one serious point I want to point out here is that so it's never a good sign when these corporations are describing uh, activists or in this case union organizers as terrorists. It reminds Absolutely. me a lot of um, so I was at Standing Rock for about a month few years ago and uh, also thanks to the Intercept we found out uh, Tiger Swan which is like the mercenary organization one of the mercenary organizations hired to. Uh, Spy on us. Uh, also described us as like jihadi terrorists, basically, and uh, it's kind of funny, especially being in the camp because it's like we were very, very peaceful vibe. Um, I was, I was doing a lot of dishes anyway. Um, but it's, it's a scary implication because we certainly were treated like terrorists, and we got that vibe. And if this is going to be the corporate response to, you know, workers organizing. Uh, is are they going to respond with the same kind of tactics? I mean, you know, again, uh, we're talking about fire hoses, so really like old school brutality. Um, it, could this be deployed against like the next, um, the next union, the next uh, strike, strike of workers uh, going on? And and any, and it's also just worth pointing out too that like um, we've also seen escalations of uh, so Embridge over in, um, I believe it was. I can't remember it was no I think it was Canada but um, they have really stepped up their tactics against water protectors uh, they have literally worked with the county governments basically um, it, this is there's a great story movement memos there's a great episode on this but basically talking about how there's a financial arrangement with between Enbridge and the local prosecutor's office and uh, the prosecutor's office was just tagging all of these water protectors with like like really severe felonies usually Local local prosecutors do not do that because again that it's, it costs a lot of money to prosecute 
um, that many people with those kinds of charges. But they thought, they thought at least, they would be getting money from Enbridge to make up for it. Turns out that they got got, which, you know, uh, you know, play stupid gain is win stupid prizes. But it Absolutely. does show, this rhetoric shows that uh, it's kind of alarming because it, it definitely shows that the corporate instinct to feel any level of threat or demand of concessions from the worker is like an existential threat uh, that they have to protect themselves from. All right. That it, I, I love smelling the, the tears of billionaires in the morning. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so... That that's that's a quick hit. I know we I know we're running out of time, and I know that you said you know we talked about uh, recording. We're gonna do, we're going to end up doing some more uh, some more clips and videos uh, throughout the week, especially since I have a new job, so I won't mm -hmm. be able to come to the studio as often. So uh, so for us to do that, um, there is a few stories that we will be getting to in another show. Uh, the book that's leaking from Trump, a former Trump administrator that talks about Trump wanting to shoot protesters. Mm. That story is insane. Yeah, and that, it's nuts. It also is going. It also speaks to the authoritarian nature of. I will say one thing, though, and it's that everybody is like in just absolutely aghast that Trump suggested shooting protesters in the leg. And there's somebody else who mentioned that. Some other famous guy. Do you remember his name? He was a. Uh, uh, oh yeah, Joe Biden. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the campaign yeah. trail suggested that yeah. also. So <laughs> the, it's not. Yeah. So so that story. That story. I, I always felt uh, felt the same. Like both. Like again, it's wrong either way. It's yeah. wrong either mm -hmm. way. But the thing that uh, makes me bothered by it is that. I don't see anybody who's running in 2024 outside of Bernie, honestly, that can beat Trump again. And you know Trump is going to run again. Yeah, Trump or, yeah. or Tucker Carlson is going to end up running again. And those two, I don't see anybody that's in the Democratic field as of right now outside of Nina or Bernie that can actually beat them. And, you know, I know it's like it's so, historically been a taboo in the last few decades to, you know, primary an incumbent. But if there's ever been a time where it's necessary to... <laughs> my God. <laughs> so, but, so, yeah. But my thing is, it's like, yeah. We see the authoritarian nature of the right wing. We, when, like, as, as the late great Maya Angelou once said, if someone tells you who they are, believe them, right? They don't care about president, even though they say they do. They don't care about uh, women's autonomy because of their right wing uh, religious ideology. They will fight for the right for you to constitutionally carry a gun anywhere you want, including bars. In public stadiums and in, in any of those places, which you know the what can go possibly go wrong bills, as I as I call them, and they don't care if we have clean air or water because or or, or uh, freedom of speech because a lot of a lot of states remember we have states in this country that pass laws that says the protesters are in the street you can run them over and not face mm -hmm. and not face penalties for it so they've shown their hand they've shown who they are and we have to fight back logically we have to fight back strategically we have to organize uh, we have to uh, we have to strategize, organize, and capitalize on this moment because if we don't, we will slowly. Uh, it, it, it's that scene in um, in the Revenge of the Sith when uh, when uh, when they said, uh, "This is how democracy dies with, to thunderous applause." Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's where we're at. We're getting closer and closer to it. Mm -hmm. And. Uh I guess I've only got like one. We didn't even touch on Ukraine. I, I had a lot of stuff to. We're getting a little closer to World War Three. I'm a little concerned about that. But um, one, I okay, guess hot, like hot hot take. Yeah. Um, hot take on Ukraine. There was multiple uh, Russian journalists that w have been getting that was sending multitudes of propaganda saying, "Hey, uh, Ukraine, Ukraine is now attacking us in Russia." Oh my God! How? 
we're being bombed in our homeland. This is so egregious. How could you do this to us? And it's like, you invaded our country first. What is wrong with you? Yeah. How about, you need to stop attacking, and again, and again, let's be clear. Innocent civilians being killed are war crimes. It doesn't matter if Ukraine is doing it to Russians or Russians are doing it to Ukrainians. It's a war crime either way. We do not condone that. I am not cool with that. Mm -hmm. At the same time, the only way this is going to end is if Russia withdraws and the sanctions, yes, have been hurting the oligarchs. And the oligarchs need to go to Putin and be like, bro, you tripping. You need to get we need we we need to get out of here. ASAP. What you doing? At the same time, this madman has threatened saying that he will drop nukes. This madman has said he will drop nukes. And we have already had an American contractor who was with who was with a private military force who died in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. That has recently happened. It's not okay. It's getting yeah. closer. And you know, like I, I, I think when we, if we do that extra I'm gonna talk a little bit. But it's like we really lost all sight of at the, like the ex. We need to be a little bit more horrified about nuclear war because I think a lot of people have uh, forgotten just what that means. But uh, uh, yeah, it, I, I think like you know, uh, on the other other hand, talking about like you know Putin, he's talking about like you know a lot of the U.S. should go. It, it, it should have been putting itself more as a peace broker for, as, instead of an instigator. Again, as we pointed out before, a lot of this happened because of, like, you know, N NATO kept poking the bear, and, you know, um, but uh, one thing Putin is correct about is Ukraine is, our response has been just funnel funnel weapons into Ukraine. We've been very overt about it. We're talking about it on the morning news and stuff. And oh, Morning Joe, Morning yeah. Joe has been morning, like yeah, Morning and, Joe and other in other talk shows, like yeah. And while again we pointed out that you know Putin's invasion of Ukraine is largely again you know it's about money and pipe you know gas pipelines and stuff. He does point out America is sending weapons to these people, blah 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 blah. Um, American-made weapons c could get used against Russia. And that escalates everything. It's like kind of related to our no-fly zone talk from a couple weeks ago. So, yeah, very concerning stuff. Um, so, you know, uh, I had one other thing I wanted to hit on. I think we're going to wrap things up. But, yeah, like Lawrence said, I think we're going to try to find some time to do some more live streams, that kind of stuff. Um, but I just want, did want to hit real quick. Um, uh, so another whole houseless camp in Kalamazoo was recently shut down. And... I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this because the issue I want to point out is literally, I could copy and paste a video I did about this about seven, eight months ago to what is my critique here, which is Channel 3's coverage of this issue has a very specific slant, a very specific anti-homelessness slant, and it almost uses the exact same language as a piece they did about eight months ago talking about uh, that encampment near Ma Mayor's Riverfront Park, which is to say taxpayer money is going to be used to clean up this camp. Oh, no. There's garbage strewn out all over the camp. And uh, in the recent coverage, they, they picked out an interview where, um, you know, to, uh, to the guy's credit, one of the residents of the houseless encampment, he was he made some very clear and concise points, but he was also like, uh, you know, he, he cursed and stuff. And, you know, it's like they, it, it, they, it seemed to me you know, if you're a journalist, you're going to interview several people, and I'm, I'm kind of curious why they chose that one. Um, and, again, you know, photographing and having video B-roll footage of garbage, and, again, emphasizing the taxpayer cost to cleaning up the hostess encampments, which, as I pointed out before, is ridiculous. We spent, like, exponentially more money on a golf course several months ago than it will cost the city to pick up or, or clean up a houseless encampment that they are evicting. So um, uh, we spend more money. Yeah. We, we spend more money. Uh, uh, they spend more money trying to build a stadium downtown than yeah. they did actually trying to build housing for homeless people. They it spent is... more money to pay <laughs> off the ACLU for uh, <laughs> slandering Nathan Dennison. <laughs> like, dog. Uh, so here's the thing. 
John Oliver had a fantastic uh, a fantastic piece on homelessness, and he also had a fantastic piece on environmental racism recently on Last Week Tonight. I I encourage everybody to uh, to uh, watch the show. I'm saying this: if Channel Three is so concerned about our taxpayer money going to these homeless people, then maybe we should be putting our taxpayer money into getting these homeless people into homes so that they can be productive tax-paying citizens. Mm. Yep, is, I sure. mean, that would be... If you're, if you're a Republican, if you're a Republican listening to that, you're like, why should we help these... Uh, if you're a Christian Republican, you uh, and you're like, why should we help these homeless bums? Let me also remind you that Jesus would have said in his parable of the lamb and the goat um and he says to the lamb uh he says to the people that he considered the lamb uh thank you for clothing me when i when i was uh, cold sheltering me when i was homeless feeding me when i was hungry healing me when i was sick not forgetting about me when i was in jail and the disciples said jesus we didn't do, uh and uh, uh, they were like jesus we didn't when do we do all do, do these things? And he says to them, "When you do it for the least of these, you do it for, for me." Mm-hmm. And I'm again paraphrasing. So it would be the moral thing. It would be the ethical thing. It would be the economic right thing to do. Because after they we get them off of the street, and like after we get people who are unhoused into houses then those house people can then start uh making much more productive um uh decisions that will then benefit our community it's a win-win for everybody mm-hmm. unless i'm missing something no nope, i think you're right That's it. <laughs> all right well uh lawrence i think might be a good time to wrap things up but uh yeah, like you said, we're going to be kind of tweaking our time slots a little bit, and um, uh, I've got to talk to Lawrence a little bit more about how we're going to do that, but uh, expect a little bit more out of uh, our Facebook page and such, and I think what I'm going to do, uh, keep an eye out on our podcast, because I'm going to have two episodes uh, coming out. I think, make sure to tune in, or, uh, uh, you know, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, look out for a podcast episode. I'm going to compile all the stuff, we, our discussion on abortion with that previous episode. And I'm going to try to be putting that out ASAP. And uh, also our conversation with Casey Groton about Radiant Church uh, buying up properties downtown. So, again, look out for both of those things coming in the next couple weeks. Uh, and until next time, keep on fighting for that revolution solution.